This is your ministry, not ours. We are prepared to speak or not to speak, to hear more or not to hear more, just according to your own desire. If it is thy mind, we spend a little more time here in thy presence for the Holy Spirit to pursue his work with us by thy word. We ask for the renewing of our spirit and of our mind, a fresh quickening, a breath of new life, a very real experience of the anointing, the anointed lips, the anointed ears, the Lord be Lord in everything, working to his own end, his own glory and pleasure. We ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. We continue with the Lord's enablement in our quest for spiritual understanding in that vast realm of the unsearchable riches of Christ. We have pointed out How varied is the context of that word riches? And we have made a very fierce attack upon one word, riches of his grace, and the word is the victor still, and we are the casualties. It has beaten us, and stands over our impotence. And we know already that it is unsearchable. Now I leave it to Brother Khan, if he feels led to make the next attack upon that word, I am passing on. <laughs> Crippled though I may be, <laughs> and I bring you to the second of the relationship of this word. The unsearchable riches of Christ, which is again found in the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1, in verse 18, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the faith. The riches of the glory 
of his inheritance in the saints. Earlier in the chapter, the apostle has referred to our inheritance in him. Now, he is speaking of his inheritance in the saints. Through this letter, again and again, the focus is upon what the law has to get. Unto the glory of his grace. Unto the praise of his glory. The riches of his glory. Christ loved the church, gave himself for it, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church. I believe, dear friends, that here we reach the heart and root and core and heart of everything in the whole Bible, from start to finish. The aspect is always himself, his, him, himself. That's the governing aspect of the whole Bible. The apostle, as you know, sums it all up in that wonderful revelation. Now unto him be the glory in the church by Christ unto all ages forever and ever. You can't get beyond that. The end. Unto him. Unto him. Yesterday, we were allowing Solomon to be our interpreter, and we shall continue to do so in this other aspect. We have reminded ourselves of the excellent Solomon, the glory, the majesty, the wealth, the wisdom that God gave to him. In his hovering toward me of his son, Jesus Christ. But we also pointed out that Solomon, not someone in himself, but that he took up the whole life of his father, David, and was really the full expression of what was in David's heart as the great dominating interest and concern of his life. I think we might just look at one or two fragments. Supposing we just look at Psalm 132. Psalm 132. Lord, remember for David all his affliction. How he swear unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty one of Jacob. Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go up into my bed. I will not give sleep to mine eyes, nor slumber to mine eyelids, until I find out a place for the Lord. 
a tabernacle for the mighty one of Jacob. Lo, we heard of it in Ephrathah. We found it in the field of the wood. We will go into his tabernacle. We will worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, into thy resting place. Thou and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy. For thy servant David, they turn not away the face of thine anointing. So on. And then just let us look at a fragment, a big fragment, so you have to reduce it. In the first book of Kings, chapter 3, 1 Kings 3, at verse 4, the king went up to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer unto upon that altar. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great kindness, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne, as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, Thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give thy servant, therefore, an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this thy great people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself. Underline. Long life, neither hast thou asked riches for thyself riches. Underline. For thyself. Nor hast asked the life of thine enemy but hast asked for thy self-understanding to discern judgment. Therefore, I have done according to thy word. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there hath been none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have given also that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee, all thy days. We must leave it there. Solomon came into the inheritance of his father. That is what he stated. 
concisely there. And Solomon acknowledged that it was so. He inherited his father's lifelong, all-dominating ambition and passion to find a place for the Lord. For the Lord. You notice that the Lord gave him all the wisdom that he had, that renowned wisdom. And God gave him all the rest, the riches and the honor and the kingdom, because Solomon turned out from himself and said, for the Lord. For the Lord. That is a, a principle throughout the Word of God, which we shall note as we go on. For the Lord, but for the Lord, in the Lord's people. In the Lord's people. This people is the Lord's the Lord's interest is in this peace. The Lord's portion is his people. The Lord's inheritance is his people. I could stop there. I think our brother has well covered that ground. Put in parenthesis this, that we can have, as we think, a very great concern for the Lord and his interests and his purpose without realizing that that is all bound up with his people. That if we are going, really, to serve the interests of the Lord, we shall find it in this one and in that in his people. That's where his inheritance is. Let us leave that for the moment. The greatness of the Lord's people immediately looms into view. What they are to the Lord. Israel in height, if you like, from his grief of being, but the church What's the church? What's the body of Christ? What the aggregate of the born again one is to the Lord? Perhaps we have to get a new apprehension of this. What believers really are to the Lord? And ourselves, of course, included. And here we are truly held with a word. We can't, can't get on till we've been confronted with this word. Unsearchable riches of Christ in his people. Unsearchable riches of Christ in you, in me. You fall when you face that. Unsearchable. Oh, yes, we did fall down before this at one thing. In me, in her, in him, in that group, that one. Christ has invested unsearchable riches. Let us make it possible. possible. Can that be true? Is it possible? Is it thinkable? If 
we know only a little the truth about ourselves. Can it be possibly that he has such wealth vested in us? That he has his inheritance in us? Unsustainable, yes, yes, beyond. Beyond our grasping, our understanding, this will exhaust every superlative. Unfathomable. Inconceivable. Inexpressible. Incomprehensible. Immeasurable. And what other words can you add? It's all in this untrustable riches of Christ of his inheritance in the thing. That word does fell us to the ground in faith. Well, that beyond me, beyond my comprehension, that it should be true that I should be, even though the smallest fragment of the whole, nevertheless a fragment of his inheritance containing his inheritance. Of course, we, we prepared the way for this a bit didn't we, by considering the riches of his grace. Grace is the way to this. It has to be. This could not be otherwise. But grace is not an end in itself. It never was intended to be an end in itself. Through grace it is to glory. The glory is in the church by Christ Jesus unto all ages, forever and ever. God's portion in his people. Now Israel, of course, is the grand Old Testament example of this, the historic example of this. God said, and here again we are out of our bounds of understanding. God said of Israel, I have chosen you from among all the peoples of the earth. God selects his name. Can you ever explain that? No, you never will. God selected me. And the Lord forgive me if I'm wrong even in an implication. But when we have read our Old Testament and into our New Testament about this people, Israel, what they were capable of, and we won't drill upon it to analyze, and what in the end they did And God knew it all from the beginning. Knew then their nature, their constitution, their disposition, their proclivity, just all that was possible in them. And how they would tax his patience, it would almost seem to the limit. Sometimes it would seem to breaking point. He would say to Moses, stand aside and let me destroy it. And make of you and God knew what, what a drain they would be upon him and his resources of patience and forbearance and long suffering. And he makes it them deliberate. I say unsearchable. Unfathomable. You would never have done that if you'd had a little bit of Ah, but would you have chosen yourself if you'd had a little bit of knowledge? 
I venture to say, dear friends, that the pathway of the true Christian life is the pathway of such a self-exclusion and uncovering that more and more we try God in mercy. If ever I get the glory, it will be the greatest miracle that ever God has. <laughs> God's selectiveness. You cannot explain it. But there it is. And when he has selected his love, his love, I have loved thee, said he to his cross, with an ever lasting love. You are graven upon the palms of my hand. Is that? Unfathomable. Inexplicable. His self-committal to that thing. He has committed himself to them. His honor. His name. His glory, his interest in the earth, committed himself, committed himself. Hear him sobbing through the prophet as they weep bitter tears. And they are the tears of God over his father. The straight, heartbroken cry of God coming out through the prophet to take up many of their utterances because of this people. God love and God disappointed love. Take out one prophet like Hosea and the story. Or Ezekiel and the tragedy in his life. His young wife taken suddenly overnight from him. His life and his heart left desolate. In the midst of the people for what? The Lord said to him in the morning, Anoint your face as at other times, and go forth, just as though nothing had happened. On with the model. Go out. Behave just as though there was no tragedy in your life at all. And he went forth, as at other times, with his face anointed, but his heart broken. But he didn't let it be seen. As at other times, he got on with his job and the men around him. This is scandal. This is a breach of every recognized principle of good behavior and conduct. What a man! Despicable man. His wife lying dead there, waiting burial. Maybe face is shining, comes out of the night. And then the word of the Lord Jesus speaks unto them. I love you. I love you. Like a husband to a wife. With all my heart and you were everything to me. And you've gone from me. You've deprived me of oh, my right, my expectations and disappointed, all oh, my hope that you go on as though nothing had happened. It does go on. It doesn't come home to your heart. The parable, you see, is a tragedy in the life to show, to show how deep God's love was and how pain God's heart was when that love was so. 
Islam was strong. I say the prophets are full of that. Broken hearted sigh and heart of God over this people, this people. Hmm. They cried, they wept for Jerusalem. Jesus came, lived there amongst them, moved amongst them, reached out those hands to them all day long as I stretched forth my hand. He was doing it. At last, with no response but that of enmity, also, Jesus standing inside on a, a place about the city, looked over the city and went. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft would I have gathered thee as a hen gathered a brood under her wings, but you would not. Weeping. There's love here for this people. You pass to Paul. How Paul said he shed bitter tears for his people this way. I could wish that I myself were a curse for my people this well. Why? Why? Were they so lovable? God knows. No more than you. And me? Why? Because he had vested interest for his own satisfaction. It was what was for him that he desired in this people. His inheritance. Him. Yes, you say, why such love to them? But more, why such love to me? And today, perhaps more than ever, why such love to this church as we know? Oh, the tragedy of it, the heartbreak of it, the distress of it. We are asking the biggest questions, aren't we, about the church? Ah, what a thing. Is there any hope for this? And yet, and yet it stands in the word of God. And the word of God cannot be broken. It endures forever. It stands for eternity and will be fulfilled. Build it and to present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such. Going to be, he has vested his eternal interest in this and he will have his deposit. In spite of you and me, Spite of all, you have it. It's going to be that my my only fortress, rock, foundation. I know the thing, the church as as it is, and Christianity as we know it, everywhere, all there are beloved, delightful saints, beautiful Christians, many of them devoted to the Lord, but when I come to the corporate aspect, the church, the collection, well, the heart sinks, doesn't it? I have to confess to you, dear friends, I have moved around this world from far east to far west, touching continent of Christians, and I do not know of one group of Christians where there is not some kind of strife or division. Where it is not at least a battle to keep together. And of course, much worse than that. 
I don't know where that ideal church is on this earth. And yet, the word says, his inheritance in the church. Well, you see, that brings us to motive. And the motive is the solution to the whole that is purified, sanctified, illuminated motive is the core, the heart, the key to everything. The motive, whether it is for the Lord or for anyone else or anything else, that's the criterion. The deciding factor. It is. Let that search up. It's the motive and the holiness and purity of the motive. You see, that takes us right back to the beginning. In the garden, God created all things for himself and for his own place and pronounced upon his word it is very good. Committed it to the man of his creation. And that evil one who had split the heavenly domain and drawn away a great company of angels who kept not their trust at stake through personal ambition, self-centered interest, he came into that scene where everything was for the Lord and insinuated this self-fully principle of himself. And the what it amounts to means of justice. Don't have it in dependence upon God or God. Have it in yourself. Have it for yourself. You can. You can be a God. You can be the center of things. The motive. God just that. And that's the fall. And from that moment, the poison, the poison of the serpent, the poison of that, that evil thing called hell. Hell. The enemy of all that is good and of God. That was, was bitten, so to speak, into the very blood of the human race. And it has developed the present dimension and is the cause of all the world's trouble. And uh, aren't we blind? Isn't the world blind? Failing to see that as we get near the end, things so intensify as to become ultimate, final, supreme on both sides. On the self side and on the unself side. And that's what God is doing. Intensifying the person. You see, where it started there, the motive, the motive, the Lord, for the Lord, unto the Lord, unto myself. Go right back to the beginning there. The great result of the focus of the direction in the garden from God. Okay. This was the tragedy of that first generation of Israel at Kadesh Barnea. Oh, what a tragedy after all those years of God's 
patience, long-suffering, forbearance. All that God had done for them, shown himself to be in their interest. The pages are near. Not trusting him at all at that point, they bend over the side. And the signs of course, came back as the embodiment of the principle that was in the nation. Helpful. We were as grasshoppers. We in their sight. Oh, it's no use going over there. We'll lose everything if we do. We shall be destroyed. In other words, how this thing will affect us. How our interests can. You see, helpful is dominating the situation. There were only two men who took the other course. They said, if the Lord, if the Lord did you know, That's the other direction. Eventually, that, that triumph. God is usually on the side of minorities, don't forget. For the minorities are usually of this time. It is a minority that is holy for the Lord, and not with some mixture of self. Joshua and Caleb were preserved while the others perished in the wilderness on the basis of selfhood. Oh, I'd like to open up there on yesterday afternoon and a letter to the Hebrews, which tells us quite plainly that it was their whole life that was the cause of the disaster at Kedish but I, I, I leave it. Unsearchable riches indeed. Certainly beyond the slot. However, here it is, you see. It's the motive. And it was the motive of Kadesh Barnier. It was the motive of Israel when Christ was crucified. If we let this go on with them, the Romans will take away. They'll take away from us. That's the spirit. It came out. Jealousy. Envy. Self-interest. Result? Two thousand years of Israel in the outer darkness. Weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth, is that true? In recent years, the millions. Oh, it's a dark story. All oh, because self was put in the place of the law. Well, here it is. This is the motive of the incarnation of God's Son, you see. And I consummated in the cross the motive behind his self emptying, his coming down in man form, the capacity of a bond slave, coming obedient. Why? To empty himself, to destroy the self principle in humanity. Yes. The emptying is not finished in heaven. All the time he is here, he is empty. Empty. Satan asks him the kingdoms of this world. No, he empties himself. All the way along he is emptying himself. Right up the cross. He has come to destroy this awful thing. Selfhood in humanity. The incarnation is the incarnation of this very motive. Not unto myself. He counted it not something to be held on to, to be equal with God. But I have come not in my own interest to serve my own name. My father. It's the father. The father. 
father, the father. This is the constant language of the son here in humiliation. The father. And the cross, I say, is the confirmation of death. The final emptying of the last bit of man's self-interest into the judgment of which he had voluntarily entered. The desolation of the cross is God's verdict upon the selfhood of man and of the devil. But turn the picture around. John 3.16. Oh, you know it. You could quote it, recite it. But do you? Do we know it? God so loved, so loved the world. God so loved the world. He emptied himself of his dearest possession, gave his only begotten son. God so loved the world. Why? Why? That's the governing question. Why? Move on to Matthew 13. You can begin to have the answer in parabolic form. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in the field, which when a man found, he sold all he had. He bought that field to get that treasure. And Jesus later said, and the field is the world. God so loved the world because he has an investment in it, a treasure. A treasure? You want the explanation of that? Well, of course, the explanation is in this lesson of Ephesians, Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, the treasure in the field. Treasure in the field. Gave himself for it, that he might present unto himself, unto himself. There it is. And I must hasten to cut this short by reminding you that this, this is the motive in all God's dealings with us. The discipline. The discipline. And he does discipline us. I'll have more to say about that in another one of these unsearchable lessons later on. But his his dealings with us are along the line of discipline. You like Paul, it's chastening. Again, it's the same thing. What is all this about? The way in which the Lord deals with us, he handles us, and empties us, and disappoints us, and all the rest of it. The motive of God is that this selfhood shall be completely undercut that he will find his inheritance in the sin. You look at what God is doing, he's undercutting our selfhood, isn't he? He's bringing us down, breaking us, emptying us, weakening us, destroying all our self-sufficiency, self-confidence, Bring us to an end of ourselves. Yes, despair. Why? Why? To really deal with this motive of self. You know, you know, dear friends, as well as I do, that our plague, the plague of our hearts is out there. Is it not? If only I could get rid of my
You see, that is the Buddhist answer to this great problem. What does the Buddhist believe? What is the basic principle of Buddhism? Self-annihilation. No, he doesn't. He doesn't burn themselves to death. And to make a demonstration of themselves. But nevertheless, there's the law. This, this consciousness in humanity, the real curse, is self. And if they're not conscious of it, it's through all the same. And God is dealing with this, understanding this, bringing it to naught, to get that which is your motive for himself. Now, Lord, I have nothing to live for but for you. If you want to use me for yourself and your own ends, all right. If you don't, Lord, it's all the same. Bring us right through like that. First, it's going to be utterly the Lord in the end, and not anything that we get. And how we have grown up to try and use the Lord for our own ends, and to believe in him just for what he can do for us. This plague again. Plague again. No. Oh, we've a long way to go. None of us has attained, neither are we already complete in this matter. But God is doing this to bring us to the place where it's the law. Just the law. Just the law. And dear friends, we shall come, we shall come into the riches like Solomon when we have truly, as God knows it, not in our ideas and imaginations, or belief about ourselves, but when the Lord knows that we have come to the place where, now Lord, everything in my life has got to be arranged for your satisfaction. For your satisfaction. You arrange all the things in my life for your pleasure, for your satisfaction. And if we will allow him to do that and seek grace when he does it, we shall come into the riches. It will be the joy of the Lord, our friend. The joy of the Lord, the Lord is blessed, because he's got what he's after, and that will be our strength. Now I must cut it short there, leave it with you. It is after all only saying in another way what has been said to us this morning, the hub of it. Humble is this sanctified, purified, blood purged motive in life. I say sanctified because you know it's possible for us to think that our motives are very pure. David made a great mistake in this matter on motive when he sent and set the ark on the new Philistine chart bring it up to Jerusalem. The Lord smote Azar, and David was thrown into consternation and was angry with the Lord. His motive was all right. He could have said, but Lord, my motive was so pure. My motive was so good. I meant it so well for your glory, your perfect. Ah, yes, but David, your motive was not illuminated, enlightened by my word. Go back to the Bible. Go back to your Bible and see about this thing. David, David went back to the scriptures and thought, oh, you can do a right thing in a wrong way. Yeah. A right thing in a wrong way because your motive was not an Ill illuminated motive. Well, I leave that. Purge motive, purge heart, blood sprinkled heart, so that our motive is purified in fire. And it's just what the Lord wants, and not what we want. The Lord's glory, the Lord's peace. 
Well, our New Testament is built upon this, isn't it? What's for the law? What's for the law? Parable of the vineyard, and at the season he sent his servant for the fruit. His right, his destiny. And they slew the servant. And he sent another. They treated him the same. And another. At last he said, I will send mine own, my son. They will reverence him. And they said, This is the heir. Inheritance. This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. And the inheritance of the what will the Lord do with those wicked servants? It's built upon this principle of whether it's for the Lord or for ourselves. The vine and the branches, the fruit, well, it's not our fruit at all, it's the Lord's fruit. And herein is my Father glorified, glorified that you bear much fruit for the Lord. He is fastening upon his right in the life of his people. And so we could go on, but I think you see that, that gathered around this all the spokes and everything else, and they come back here. The riches of his inheritance in the saints. Will you hold your life in the light of that? Will you hold your local fellowship in the light of that? Not what a place you have. Not how it affects you, good or bad. But always, always in your relationships, in local companies, and your individual position, let this govern. We are here for the Lord, not for ourselves. Does this, does this really please the Lord? Is this situation of division, of strife, of bitterness, does this really please the Lord? Can the Lord have glory in this? If not, then look here. Anything. It cost me everything, anything and everything, to get this right. Half a is necessary, but this is not for the pleasure of the Lord. Oh, if we only took that attitude. If only that were the dominating thing in all. There would be such wealth. Such glory, and I believe such dominion as with Solomon over all the enemies round the back. The enemy will be spoiled, believe me, when his own ground is taken from him, which is the ground of self. Now, Lord, it is for thee to keep alive what has been of thee in this nut speaking this morning. O oh Lord, we must commit it to Thee. Too much for us. But bring home to us those salient things that really do matter, that are going to be the issues of this week. Things that are going to be found abiding, living, and governing. To let thy seal upon those things in our hearts for thy name's sake.